Hey, y'all, thanks for the questions. Really good questions this time. We're getting deep into the topic. And keep in mind, genetics is a very advanced topic that usually isn't taught until like undergrad, the end of undergrad. And it's not widely understood by a lot of people that use the results of it. They don't always necessarily understand the methods because it's really, really complex. And I'm not a geneticist. I, for the most part, just use the results of it. I'm not the one out doing the testing. So I'm doing kind of my basic understanding of how to go about doing the genetics combined with the part that I do, which is the statistics and mathematic modeling, which is taking the results from the genes and using a lot of math, very complex math that's like way past college level and using that to make result or using that to come to a better understanding of species. It's a really complex topic, so I'll try to boil it down to what's like reasonable for you to understand. Reasonable for someone that hasn't been working at it for years to understand. So first, here's something fun. I got a new microphone, but totally forgot that microphones need cords. So audio will be good as of next video. McKinley asks, what is the biggest difference between the two penguins? So keep in mind, we can't just go off one difference to say it's the same species. So we can have the biggest difference, and that will be maybe the biggest contribution to thinking they're separate. But we can't just say, you know, this one thing is what makes them separate. So we have the physical differences. Those are pretty minor. We have the audio differences. That's pretty minor. We have that they live in denser colonies. You know, that could just be there's more of them in fewer areas they can live. So that's not necessarily a behavior versus an environmental thing. It is a behavior thing, at least some aspect. But it could also be partially environmental. But what I find a really big difference beyond the genetics, beyond the physical and all that is they breed twice in a season. Like that's so unique amongst penguins. But again, it's something that's possible for other species to do. Like Korora in Otero, New Zealand, they can breed twice, but that's only when the first set died very early on. So if they lay an egg and the egg gets squashed within a few days, they can just, you know, lay more eggs. But the only penguins in the world that will lay some eggs, have them hatch, bring them all the way to adulthood, and then lay more eggs and bring them to adulthood in the same season, the only ones to do that are the Australian penguins. So that's extremely unique. Ethan asks, what is your favorite animal species? So I think I'm supposed to be biased towards the Korora, the little blue penguin, because I work with them and I do really like them. They're very cute. Uh, they have really funny personalities and social behaviors and things. But I think, if I'm being honest, probably my favorite is the African painted dog, sometimes called the African wild dog, but we don't like to use that name because sometimes people think that means they're just wild dogs that escaped and are going around attacking or whatever. It's not what they are. They aren't rabid dogs. It's a completely different species, not even in the same genus as dogs. Um, yeah, they're really adorable. Uh, I worked with them for a little bit at the Dublin Zoo. They have really fun social behaviors. Like, they're democratic. They vote by sneezing to make decisions as a group. So that's really cool. As well as their social structures of uh, the young ones have to eat first, and then the elders, and then in the middle, the middle-aged ones get to eat last, and they all have to eat together, and all the different families work together as a tribe. It, it's really hard to separate them from being like anthropogenic. Uh, um, it's called anthropomorphizing or seeing human behaviors in animals. I mean, humans are animals, but uh, painted dogs, I really see that. I mean, democracy and social structures and things. It's pretty cool actually watching it in practice. Next we have, how does the flipper on the penguin change color? So essentially just growing up. So you already know when they're babies, they have those down feathers, those really fluffy warm feathers before they head out into the water. They lose that and they gain their first set of feathers. And that's where you have that white flipper. And then a bit later on, they're going to go and molt, which is losing all their feathers and growing all new ones, making sure they're good, waterproof, and those are their adult feathers. So all penguins, every year of their life, go and molt. They lose all the feathers. And in that first molt is where they transition from being a juvenile with the white flipper to being an adult with the blue flipper. Unless they're Albus ignata, which are the ones that keep that white flipper all through their life. Kinley asks, why do you like science? Also, hi. Hi, Kinley. Uh, I like science because I like learning. I think we all do. Um, sometimes whenever it's like in memorize this fact kind of form, learning isn't fun, but we all kind of like going out and discovering and learning. Uh, and that's what I really like about science is can you go out and discover something that no one's ever known before and get to put that forward so that everyone from now on knows this new bit of information. So in the past for me, that was like warthog behavior and how turlock plants develop. And now looking at how penguins behave and how those birds are affected by cities. So those are things that I'm finding out and it's a whole discovery process for me. And you gotta do lots of fun methods and play with penguins. Uh, but then you put it forward and now everyone knows it. You've made a contribution to human knowledge. And I just think that's really cool. What is your main goal for the penguins? And Ellis asked that. So my main goal for this study, frankly, is to get my PhD, to get my degree. Uh, as for the study, I'd really like this study to provide really strong recommendations to the city on these are the birds that are impacted by the city in these ways, and this is what we can do to prevent those impacts. As for the penguins specifically, I would love for them to have their species split up. That's absolutely necessary to protect penguins in Otero, New Zealand, 
is to have them recognized as a separate species from Australia. Like I talked about in the other video, they aren't considered endangered because there's tons of them in Australia, but they're really not doing well here in Otero, New Zealand, and they need to be split up for that. So that's like priority number one, get them split up as a species. Uh, I'd like to have more safe places for them to nest because there's predators everywhere. I want more predator-free areas for them to nest and recolonize so that they aren't bunched into a really small area. And most generally, just allow them to continue thriving near cities. Find the ways that cities can have less of an impact on them so that they can continue living nearby because I mean, who wouldn't like to see a penguin on the way to work every day? And that's just the human-centered aspect. They have a right to live here. Humans weren't here first, the penguins were, and then we moved in and kind of kicked the penguins out. So I'd like them to be able to survive in their home, and that's really important to me. What is your favorite picture that you took? Ooh, I take a lot of pictures. Like, I take a thousand, probably, pictures each time I go out and do some work, so there's a lot of pictures competing for that. Maybe you can vote on this. So what's immediately coming to mind is picture of a shy kaka right here, or a parrot. I uh, saw that at Mongototori over the, <laughs> over the holiday break when my family was here. Uh, also a takapu looking up its parents' beak, looking for food, a very hungry little baby takapu looking for food because like birds, they regurgitate to feed the babies and the baby was very hungry right there. And also going further back into the past, this picture of a bald eagle eating a seal. My mom and I saw that in Homer, Alaska last year. And then also I'm thinking this picture I took of Steel Falls in Scotland a few years back. Those are probably the ones that most immediately come to mind as my favorite ones that I ever took. Carly asks, what is your favorite dog breed? I have a chocolate lab named Jazzy. Oh, I like chocolate labs. They have really fun personalities to them. Definitely my favorite dog breed is Husky. My mom's taking care of my Husky, Fen. He is the greatest dog in history. That's scientifically proven. We have all the paperwork proving he is the best dog in history. Uh, and even before him, I had other Huskies and they're just so fun. They're tons and tons of work. Uh, very energetic, they shed everywhere, they're very rebellious, but the energetic is also a fun aspect to them, the rebellious aspect also pretty fun, uh, they just have really goofy personalities. I really like huskies, plus they're just gorgeous. Caden asked, very important, how many kiwis would it take to beat a seal or sea lion, whatever lives there, in a fight? So I'm gonna, let's go with Kekano, let's go with the sea lions that are around here and I've interacted with. Oh, that's a really tough question. It would have to be in like the thousands, it would have to be the thousands, because kiwi are pretty, pretty pathetic. They, they can't really take care of themselves in a fight at all, and that's why they're endangered. Uh, I think it would literally have to be enough kiwi stacked on top of a kekano that it would like collapse the kekano's bones or something. <laughs> kiwi are pretty, pretty weak. It would be thousands. <laughs> Carson and Isaac asked, why do you speed up your videos? Uh, so I don't take up your entire class, uh, so that it takes up less time, as well as I only do it for like segments that I feel I was speaking really slowly. Usually I just try to speak faster so it's less of an issue. Also, I suggest you go look at some other YouTube videos. There are no YouTube videos, or very few YouTube videos, that aren't sped up. Pretty much everyone speeds up the videos, or at least clips out any dead moments where they're saying, uh, or breathing in, those sorts of things. What is your favorite part about New Zealand? Uh, so definitely the nature and the wildlife and everything. I mean, there's a reason they chose it to be Middle Earth. It's gorgeous, gorgeous landscapes and forests and all these incredible environments. Uh, they, I mean, Lord of the Rings didn't even touch on the marine environment, which is just stunning. Tons of gorgeous islands and... Yeah, it's a really beautiful landscape and environmental area. Mark asks, are you close with the penguins that you work with? Uh, so they change each season and they all pretty much look the same. Penguins aren't that diverse in appearance, so I can't always know if it's the same one. But yeah, sometimes you get kind of caught up in the story of a certain nest. Like there's one in particular I'm thinking of at Tafra Nui that I saw when the chicks were still eggs, when they had just hatched a couple days before, when they were a few weeks old, when they were a few months old and then right before they left the nest. Like, I think it was literally they left the nest that very day because we didn't see them the next day. So it was really cool watching them grow up kind of in fast forward. In like three months, I saw them go from eggs to tiny little penguins to full-grown ferocious miniature predators. And uh, that was really cool, yeah. But it's probably not gonna be the same birds each year. And we're not banding them because penguin bands sometimes have health issues and it's not really important to our question anyway. So I'm not even gonna know if it's the same penguins year in, year out. So I get very attached to the species, and sometimes within a season I might notice certain stories, but overall it's not like I know this one and it has a name, that sort of thing. Can you please go into more depth in looking at the genetics part? Okay, so we're going to have to really dive in deep on this one. There's going to be some complex topics. So I'm going to have to assume you all understand the basics of genetics, you know, ATCG, and how they split apart and recombine and cell cycle and those sorts of things, because otherwise we're going to be here for hours. So working off that assumption. So. Most DNA doesn't actually make that much of an impact. So like humans have 3 billion base pairs in the human genome. And so that's like each pair of A and T or C and G. So 3 billion of those. Most of that doesn't actually code for anything. It doesn't actually make an impact. It doesn't say, 
blue eyes, green eyes, uh, uh, tall, short, whatever. It doesn't do any of that. Most of it's what's called non-coding. And some of those non-coding ones control to what extent the coding genes uh, actually express themselves. So like the non-coding for tall could go wild and say you're Shaq, or it could, the non-coding should, could say that uh, it's not going to be that impactful and you get Danny DeVito. So non-coding isn't zero impact, it's just less impact. And a lot of those non-coding sections multiply. So you have a segment that says ATAT. And for some people, it'll say ATAT 20 times. For some people, it'll say it four times. And those are usually pretty distinct passed down from your ancestors. And if you look at enough of those segments, you can piece together who those ancestors were based on percentages. Like we know the ATAT segment at this one point is seen in 2% of the population. And then at another point, we have GCAT. And that one is seen in 1% of the population. And at another point, we have this certain segment in this one place that says T, 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 T. And we know that, you know, 1% of people have that repeated six times. So based on all those different segments and how they recombine and how many copies you have, you can kind of piece together who you were related to in the past. So we have those three billion base pairs. Some of them are unique in that they're passed along from your ancestors. The reason they're unique is because about 1% of each base pair, or 1% of base pairs, each time that it's replicated, each generation, about 1% of the base pairs have changed or mutated. So if you have a really distinct mutation in a certain spot, and then you pass it on to your offspring, they will have that mutation in that spot. And then the geneticist looking at it can say, okay, that's very unique. We can trace it back to this ancestor that developed that mutation. It's kind of like a game of telephone where let's say the person starting it says a normal sentence like Spencer's the best. And then you're going through and it changes slightly. It's like Spencer has always been the best. Spencer will always be the best. Spencer is great. Those sorts of things. And it's just, it's kind of the same thing as you move along, just normal facts like that. Uh, and then you get to a certain point and someone has a mutation and they just uh, say pizza is a really good food. Completely different from the rest of the telephone game. Um, mutations don't do it on purpose to mess with the game or whatever, like that probably would be in the game of telephone. Uh, so just by random chance, instead of continuing with small changes, there's a sudden very distinct change. And that's a very significant mutation. So now everyone that talks about pizza from then on, instead of talking about me, which every conversation should be, uh, anyone talking about pizza, then we know that they heard it from the person that made that mutation. And instead of it being a chain, it's branching. It's the person at the beginning said, Spencer is the best to two or three people. And each of those two or three people kept passing it along. But at a certain point in each of those branches, you're going to have someone that makes a significant change. You have the person that says pizza is the best food. You have another person that says New Zealand is a country in the Southern hemisphere. And <laughs> you have another person that says, I'm not sure whether peanut butter is solid or liquid. You're gonna have like random, really weird mutations like that. And those are very distinct. And there's a very small, like virtually zero chance that the person that changed it to a conversation about peanut butter will ever have their conversation about New Zealand match up together. And so in that way, we know those changes are very distinct to that lineage, to that ancestor of the message. So that's the basics of how mutations works and how we kind of relate. This one is related to this ancestor. It's the same way that we catch criminals with DNA is looking at those areas that are different amongst humans because the vast majority of DNA is identical between all humans. We're looking at those segments that are different and comparing. So an example right here, we have the word eudiptola, and then we make small changes. We change one letter or one number each time to make it a slightly different message. And as you go further along, they're getting more and more different, and you can't even recognize them as coming from the same beginning. You have some things that are similar. You have the PTUL. So we know, okay, this is within the eudiptola family, but then we can break it into the ones that have a seven in them. We have the ones that have a six in them because those are very distinct changes at a certain point in the genome of the word that say these are related, that these ones were descended from the same ancestor. So that's kind of the same way we do genetics, comparing subspecies and species. So we could look at the word eudiptola as the species and then the subspecies being the ones that have a six or a seven or an eight in them. That's essentially what it comes down to, but across billions of base pairs. And when I said humans have three billion base pairs, we do not have the most complex genome. Uh, there's a flower in Japan that has 159 billion <laughs> base pairs in their genome. Lungfish have 130 billion. They're incredibly complex. Uh, and it gets even more for a lot of plants that have what's called polyploidy, 
which their genome might be, you know, 50 billion base pairs, but they multiply their genome eight times over. So they then have 400 billion base pairs. Um, so it's incredibly complex. But if you can find those really distinct beginnings, that tells you how they're related to either their ancestors or their offspring. And so if you remember the example that I had with the Turlocks in the last video, I had those two axes. So that was what I thought was kind of the best demonstration of how clustering works, how you determine this cluster is different from this other cluster. But let's get into the details of how it represents that. So because there's all those billions of base pairs and most are identical, we just throw out all the ones that are identical between every one we sample. Because there's no point comparing, oh yeah, they both have an A in this spot. There's no point comparing them. So you just look at areas that are different between the ones you've sampled, and then you group them based on, they have this segment, they don't. They have this segment, they don't. So the Turlock example, uh, axis one right there, is based uh, off mostly uh, ranunculoides and moss. So how much moss and ranunculoides you have is very heavily weighted to how far along that axis is. And then the other axis is much more about Sheenus and Baldelia, which these are all just plants. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what the species is. Uh, this is just kind of showing this is how we determine the grouping is based on these plants, which you can think of as these genes. So you'd say the gene Baldelia is a good indication that they're in this group, and the gene Sheenus is a good indication they're in this group. So you cluster using those types of indicators, and across a genome of billions, it's usually like 50 to 100 to 500 different, uh, different what we call loci, or different spots on the genome that have certain traits in them. You might say they have an A in this one spot, so they fit in this group somewhat, because you also have the ones that are just related. If I have this one mutation, there's a strong chance that I share this other mutation that popped up in the same ancestor and were passed on to all the offspring of those ancestors. So you have a lot of linked genes that are similar to other genes because they came from the same ancestor that made that mutation. The limitation of this process is it doesn't tell you how significant those differences, it's just comparing within those groups. And you have the out group, like I mentioned, you have like a king penguin and you say, okay, this is how they're separate from king penguins, but you still don't get much indication of how separate you are within those clusters. And so another approach is called the phylogenetic tree. And it looks like this, uh, again, for the Turlock example, because it's kind of a simplified form of genetics. It shows you where they split, but it doesn't necessarily give you a lot of information about how significant that split is. So you can see group five right there is very separate from groups one through four. Yeah, but how separate? Is it, I mean, group five, it could be a marine environment. It could be a completely different thing that we logically know isn't the same, but it would show up on a phylogenetic tree the exact same way. They split early on, but we don't know how early on that is. It could be a completely distinct thing with nothing in similar, with nothing at all similar between them, but it would still appear the same way. And then you can see within groups one through four, you know they're all more closely related to each other than they are to five, but how closely related? You have those other splits, but how significant are those splits? Are they species different? Are they subspecies different? Are they family different? Are they even like order different? Phylogenetic trees don't give you a great example of that and neither do um, clustering on those X, Y axes. And that's why you need to have the other aspects to it. Do they interbreed? Are they physically similar? Do they behave the same way? Those sorts of things. So you have the clustering to show kind of how close, and you have the phylogenetic tree to show where the separations happened so that you can have a sharper line for it. And so when we looked at the penguin genetics, not my study, this is another study. Um, when we looked at that, it essentially said, yeah, they're group five, they're separate, and they're closer than a king penguin, but how separate are they? They're not like, they're definitely not closer to a king penguin than they are to other little penguins, but they are kind of separate. The Aussie penguins were more dissimilar between the Aotearoa subspecies, because there's five different subspecies of Corora in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And the Aussie ones were separate from that, but only in the sense that they were less similar. It wasn't way off in the distance. It was just saying these five are pretty, pretty similar relative to how similar this one is. So it can't just straight up say you are a different species. It could just be you're a less related subspecies. Jocelyn said, I like how you explained it. I personally don't think they're the same, but I can see the genetic thing. Yeah, I'm glad that it came across pretty clearly, but the genetic thing is just one aspect to it. Kind of like how you could argue that them being physically similar and having similar calls is an argument against splitting them up. You could say the genetic thing is the same. Uh, it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle and it's not blocking off the puzzle as a whole. 
It's just saying, you know, they're kind of different, so maybe you could use this as some evidence for it, but it's not definitive. The same way them being slightly bigger is one piece of the puzzle, but you can't definitively say, no, they're not big enough or whatever. But I'm glad that came across really clearly. So have you experienced both of the behaviors personally, or is this off of different work? Uh, it's the Australian behaviors are off of different work. The Otero ones are based off my work and the work of my colleagues in my lab. And that's because, like I said in the past video, Australian penguins have been very well documented, especially there at Phillip Island in Australia. They have so many articles on it, and they have live streams and interviews and scientific articles and all those sorts of things. That just doesn't exist in Aotearoa for them. Uh, there's many fewer scientific articles published on them, and those that exist are mostly like a master's student project instead of like, I mean, not to put down the quality of master's students' work, but it's usually not at the level of a whole team of professional scientists. So a lot of it's that, a lot of it's very short term, and even within Aotearoa, it's focused in Otago, which is where the Australian penguins have recolonized. So a lot of the things that are like Aotearoa's penguins are really Australia's penguins. Uh, there have been very, very few studies of penguins in Aotearoa outside of Otago. And kind of like I brought up in the last one, the reason they're looking at those Otago penguins is because of the Australian behaviors, the ones that make them easier to study, that they all come up at once, that they live in dense colonies, that they breed twice, so you get two breeding cycles in a year. So I understand why they would be easier to study, but by focusing on those, you've kind of ignored this entire other group. Yeah, so essentially, no need to reinvent the wheel on the Australian ones, but the Korora really need to have the wheel built in the first place. Colleen asks, how come two horses or two donkeys can breed, but two mules can't? What makes them infertile compared to others? Is it just because they have mixed genes or both? Okay, so let's start with what donkeys and horses are. They're both in the same genus, uh, Equus, and that means they're closely related, but they are different species. So they're extremely similar, but they're different enough that they can't genetically intermix. Uh, they can't interbreed successfully. So donkeys have 31 sets of chromosomes, and horses have 32 sets of chromosomes, or 64 chromosomes in total for the horses, and 62 in total for the donkeys. And if you remember, when they're reproducing this whole cell cycle thing, you get the number in half, so horses contribute 32 chromosomes to their offspring, and if it's two horses, 32 plus 32 is 64, and they're back to where they started. With donkeys, 62 divided by 2 is 31. Uh, each of them contribute 31 chromosomes. 31 plus 31 is 62. But if you have one donkey and one horse, 31 plus 32 is 63. That's an odd number, so you can't split it down the middle for reproducing. That's not to say it's impossible, because it has been done before. I, I looked all over the internet and scientific records and things. I've only found two examples of mules breeding successfully before, and they were both when the female was the mule and the male was the horse, and both of those offspring died very quickly because they were kind of malformed from having mismatched chromosomes. And the reason mules are different from either horses or donkeys is because they have that mixture. And the mixture becomes much more of a problem when they then have to go and reproduce it again. So thanks for all those questions. I know genetics is super complex. I totally would get if some of this went over your head. And if there's something that you want me to go over more, I'm happy to do that. Uh, just be aware, there are some things that I'm just going to have to say, this is absurdly complex and I can't explain it without going into a lot of very technical things that are based on assumptions that are, you know, 10 years off for y'all in education. Because like I said, genetics is usually something you get at the very end of undergrad, moving into graduate school, and even a lot of like biology professors have never actually done the genetics work. They work off of the results, but they've never done the process themselves. So there's a lot of complexities to it that are kind of hidden to anyone that hasn't worked in it for decades. So I'll try to answer it as best I can, but there are some things that are just, you know, beyond me, much less beyond the level of biology training y'all have had so far. So thanks for all those questions, and if there's anything more I can clarify, please ask.